Thank you, Sarah. Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining our webinar as we bring IBD experts here to answer COVID-19 questions that are on your mind. Coping with a chronic, chronic disease such as Crohn's or colitis can be challenging physically as well as emotionally, particularly now. It's been several months since the pandemic started and no doubt the uncertainty has created anxiety and a toll on our emotional well-being. In this webinar, you will hear from experts on dealing with stress and coping strategies as we battle this pandemic and IBD together. Along with the content covered, Crohn's and Colitis Canada has you covered with a number of resources available on our website, including tips and videos. A big thank you to everyone who purchased a gutsy mask. We sold out fast and are busy packaging and sending out the orders. I know everyone is anxious to get their mask. We ask for your patience as safety precautions in the packaging and distribution process are required and add time. For those that missed out, don't worry. We hope to have more in the near future. This is our last call for IBD scholarship applications. Every year, Crohn's and Colitis Canada awards 10 AbbVie IBD scholarships of $5,000 to students of any age living with Crohn's or colitis who are enrolled in a Canadian post-secondary educational institute for the upcoming fall session. Please be sure to submit your application by June 1st. Now and always, a big thank you to our task force who volunteered their time and skills to discuss policies and recommendations necessary for our community during these times. Thank you today. Thank you to today's panelists, Dr. Leslie Graff and Dr. Charles Bernstein. And of course, much appreciation to our fantastic moderators, Dr. Gail Kaplan, who is an adult gastroenterologist and epidemiologist at the University of Calgary, and Dr. Eric Benjamal, Associate Professor in Gastroenterology at the University of Ottawa. Thank you. Thank you, Thanks, Mina. Mina. Yeah, so today we've got um, a really um, special webinar planned. Um, really, to, uh, it's totally focused on mental health. And in, in the past webinars, we've had um, segments devoted to mental health, but we've never really just focused the entire webinar uh, on this topic. And we're really lucky today because we have two world-renowned experts, uh, Dr. Charles Bernstein, who's actually a mentor to both myself and Eric um, since we've started this um, our clinical and, and research careers um, and he's done a tremendous amount of research in the field of IBD and, um, and including a lot of work on, on the mental health aspects of the disease and, and Dr. Leslie Graff is a phenomenal psychologist from the same institution at the University of Manitoba um, who has done a lot of research in this area too. So two amazing speakers that are going to really spend um, a lot of quality time talking to you about mental health and, and not only do we have them speaking today to the IBD community but we also have a special webinar that we have set um, later this evening for healthcare professional physicians and nurses who are so keen to also hear from them um, to learn kind of more kind of the, the medical side of things and how to help manage their patients who might be struggling um, with depression, anxiety and other mental health issues uh, during the course of this uh, pandemic and because we're doing two uh, webinars we're going to actually um, make the current one just one hour long and for that reason um, you know I'm just going to do a, a short update just to kind of show where things are at in the in the past week uh, and then we're going to get Dr. Bernstein and Dr. Graf to come on right away so that we have as much time with them they have a phenomenal presentation set up and then afterwards um, we're going to have a question and answer period including um, questions that you have so if you have questions for Dr. Bernstein and Dr. Graf please write them in the chat box and Eric and I will will moderate those questions at the at after their presentation. I have to say, Gil, that I, I just wanted to add that uh, those last two days, we've actually been attending the uh, annual meeting of the Canadian Association of Health Services and Policy Research, obviously virtually online. They've been running some lectures. And it's really, it's it, that meeting has brought home to me that we, we're starting to deal with not what's happening now with COVID-19 and the danger to people and the danger to IBD patients who, as you'll show, are, are still doing very well. Uh, we've kind of gotten over that first peak and now we're starting to look at how COVID-19 in the long term is going to have impact on our health system and on patients and on the public. And mental health was a huge part of all the lectures that we heard the last couple of days, because I think we, we, you know, we reacted very strongly to going into quarantine, going into isolation to prevent that peak and, and prevent the burden on the health system. But it has led to some unintended consequences and mental health consequences for people uh, being isolated for so long has really been one of them. So I think this is a really timely topic. Absolutely. So, um, Sarah, so I'll just take over the control of the screen. Um, 
and um, okay, so this is a a familiar slide. Again, I want to start by thanking uh, Joseph Windsor and Stephanie Coward, who every week crunch numbers and put together these really impressive slides. Um, you know, this is. I can't actually even remember, I think the 11th webinar we've we've done now in a, in, a, in a row, starting on March 19th. And as everyone remembered, back then there was only 230,000 cases of COVID um, confirmed through this John Hopkins University website. And they've been tracking cases uh, throughout the course of this, um, this pandemic. And if you look back at the last three weeks on May 14th, we had over 4 million people. Last week when we did this webinar, we had crossed the 5 million mark. And um, as of today, almost 6 million people across the world and 188 countries have um, been uh, uh, diagnosed with uh, COVID and uh, unfortunately 350,000 people have um, passed away. When we look at it from a, um, a country specific uh, perspective, um, these are countries now that have reported at least 10,000 cases or more. We've now seen that number has gone up to, to 50. And as we watch um, the Sorry, as we watch the, the countries, you can follow here. The green ones are going to be countries that have 1 to 50 cases per 100,000. Um, the yellow ones are 50 to 200 cases per 100,000. And the red ones are 200 COVID positive cases for every 100,000 um, people living in, in that country. Um, and every, every week we add more people, so this incidence is naturally going to increase on a week-to-week -week, uh, basis. Um, and you can see that um, you know there are many countries now that have over 200 cases per 100,000 uh, people, including um, Canada, which is at 237 cases per 100,000. Um, and if we look specifically at, at Canada, again, this is a, a great website from um, Esri Canada that tracks um, all the cases that are reported um, across the country. Um, again, um, if you remember in, back on March 19th, there were 230,000 people in the world and 782 Canadians who were COVID positive. Um, a week later, that number jumped to 3,400 people. Uh, and we can see now that in the last three weeks, um, the numbers have um, climbed to 72,000 people on May 14th, up to 80,000 people, uh, and now to 87,000 people. The, the one positive sign is this number here is declining. And this is reporting the number of cases over the past six days of the past week. Um, and you can see that these numbers are getting smaller and smaller. And I'll show you that, that um, specificity of that in, in the next slide as well. Uh, unfortunately, 6,765 Canadians have passed away from, from COVID. Uh, looking at cases specifically across the country, um, we can see that uh, uh, Quebec continues to be the hardest hit province with uh, nearly 50,000 um, individuals living in Quebec who've tested positive for um, COVID, uh, followed by Ontario, Alberta having uh, quite a few cases relative to their population size as well. Um, and when we look at this from a week-to-week -week basis, this is actually um, just a, a new um, graphic that I've um, shown you here. And these are active cases, so people who are still considered actively infectious with COVID. So what we're doing is removing the people who have now recovered from COVID from this. And again, you can see that um, that the numbers uh, are reflective of, of the uh, size of the province. But the other thing I just want to show you here are the number of new cases in the, in the past week. And you can kind of see which provinces are actually doing um, quite well with very few cases uh, versus those provinces that are still having um, higher um, cases. But again, everything that we look at when it comes from a province perspective should be standardized by the size of the province. Obviously, a province with a larger population size like Ontario is going to have more cases than provinces that are smaller. And so these are the cases um, divided by 100,000 people living in the province, so the number of cases per 100,000 people. And you can see Quebec continues to be amongst the hardest hit um, is the hardest hit province in the country and amongst the hardest hit regions in in the in the world um, whereas other places are doing you know much better uh, where dr Bernstein and dr Graf are, are from from Manitoba they continue to do well with um, only 20 cases per hundred thousand people in their population um, Alberta and climbing up there at 156 um, uh, um, similar to Nova Scotia here is the hardest hit province in um, in the Maritimes so I just wanted to finish this by giving you an update on the, the secure registry. So this is the um, registry that was um, developed out of uh, 
University of North Carolina and Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. Um, and uh, back on uh, the 23rd of April, we had uh, Dr. Kappelman and Dr. Brenner who started up this registry to talk to us about the Secure IVD registry. Um, and again, and this is a, a site that um, my research team has put together um, showing uh, the data from uh, the Secure Registry, which are COVID positive individuals who have inflammatory bowel disease. Um, and you can go onto this site and look at where, which countries are reporting cases. Um, and uh, as of this week, there has been 1,302 IBD patients who have been tested positive for COVID of which uh, 45 have passed away. And these numbers are similar to what we're seeing when we look at the general population and similar to the general population where the people who are, have had the hardest outcomes are those who are older. Um, we see this, that same data here um, in the IBD population, whereas these are the number of cases um, who have survived and these reflect the number of people who have uh, died from COVID. And you can see that the people who are older are the ones who have um, the most severe outcome, and, and that is death. And again, and this reflects um, kind of the whole topic of what we wanted to talk about um, today. And what I'll do is I'll kind of um, not share my screen and, and bring Eric uh, on, on board here. Um, and again, what, what we really wanted to try to do um, today was really focus on mental health aspects of it, because we've all been in this, this lockdown for quite a long time, and we've all seen data like the one I've just showed you where uh, so there, are, there are unfortunate people, including people who have had inflammatory bowel disease who have passed away, really difficult for our, our older population who have had kind of, you know, it's they've been stressed, locked into their homes, and at the same time having this fear and anxiety related to um, the potential risk of contracting the disease, even for young people too, um, being immunocompromised and despite all the information and recommendations that we passed along, it's, it's very stressful. And that's why we really wanted today to focus on, on mental health. Yeah, no, thanks very much, Gil. Thanks for the update. Uh, so I want to introduce our speakers and then we'll, we'll kind of step back for a little while, let them present a little bit of information and then maybe answer some questions after that. So firstly, Dr. Leslie Graff. Dr. Graff is a professor and head of the Department of Clinical Health Psychology at Max Rady College of Medicine at the University of Manitoba and is the medical director of the psychology services for the Winnipeg Health Region. She's a clinical psychologist and scientist with extensive experience uh, and interest in GI conditions and psychological processes. And then next up is uh, somebody who's known to many of us, uh, Dr. Charles Bernstein, is a distinguished professor of medicine, Brigham, Bingham Chair in Gastroenterology Research and Director of the Inflammatory Bowel Disease Clinical and Research Center at the University of Manitoba. He's uh, a fellow of both the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences and the Royal Society of Canada Science Division. And in 2019, he won the Crohn's and Colitis Canada Research Leadership Award uh, he's been a mentor to both both Gil and I, and certainly uh, a mentor to many people in the community of researchers and clinicians across Canada and internationally. And so it's a, a great pleasure to welcome back Dr. Bernstein. Uh, Dr. Bernstein has a research and clinical interest in the mental health of patients with IBD. So certainly very qualified to speak to you here today. Uh, so I will pass it over to Dr. Graf and Dr. Bernstein to present for a little bit. There, thank you. I'm just checking that I've got uh, slide control here. Um, at, w thank you for the invitation, the opportunity to be part of this, the opportunity to be able to uh, connect with those with IVD and their families across Canada and talk about what I agree is a very important uh, area to be thinking about, not just now, but going forward. Um, there we go. So we do have a polling question for you just to start off with. Since COVID-19, are you experiencing greater mental health challenges? And it's a simple yes or no. And so I think you can see on the screen that uh, the, the large majority, three quarters of those who've answered 
have said, yes, in fact, you have, you are experiencing greater mental health challenges. You're not alone, and it's not uh, just because you have IBD. There's many people across Canada who are really struggling with the challenges of COVID, of social isolation, of all of the changes that have happened. So uh, hopefully some of the session today will help to give you some ideas about where to go with that. Thank you for, thank you for letting us know about that. Here we go. Uh, so I just wanted to uh, go back to a little bit about what Eric was saying a moment ago in trying to get a big picture view of where this pandemic might be taking us. And uh, this is a diagram that has been uh, going around. I think it helps to give an, a, a sense of it's not just about COVID and the impact, COVID-19, the impact of the disease. You see that in the purple wave there. That's where all of our attention has been focused uh, in the health system. And of course, I think across the country and even in day to day is preparing for and protecting from COVID. Um, and you'll see that uh, over the, the first hit, we seem to be kind of coming, starting to come down through that first wave. We're anticipating there probably are going to be more waves. But if you look at other impacts in the healthcare system, if you look at what's called that second wave, uh, that's focusing on other areas, uh, other aspects of health um, that may be where we're, uh, people might be coming into hospital for other reasons than COVID. And we need to start paying attention to and picking up and caring for uh, that area. Also though, uh, chronic disease were just concerns that many people have been waiting to look after their illness and that uh, we're gonna see some impacts of that. But the fourth wave is that red line that you see so early into the, um, the, the onset of the COVID pandemic spread, we start to see some impact of um, on people's mental health, how they're feeling about things, how they're managing. But as you can see, that actually keeps rising over quite an extended time. And that is the prediction um, from what we know from past pandemics that um, there may be a cumulative effect for people, uh, just the wear and tear of all of the changes, all of the pressures, uh, economic, health, and so on over time. So we have some awareness that we have to be ready. Um, and that maybe there's things we can do now that are going to um, help people recognize and manage with um, their stress and with their mental health to be able to uh, weather this and move forward. So a number of you said that you in fact have noticed the mental health challenges or changes since the beginning of COVID. You are definitely not alone. There have been a number of different surveys across Canada that have um, been asking some of those same questions. And just want to highlight um, some information. These surveys were done late April, so we're already a few weeks past that. But um, uh, just to highlight that the number of people who are regularly feeling stress has doubled since the beginning of COVID. So about 20% of the population was saying, yeah, before COVID, I often felt quite stressed. Now it was almost 46% of the population is saying more recently, I'm feeling stress all the time. Half of the population survey, these are all adults, uh, were reporting that their mental health is worsening. And in fact, one in 10 were saying it's really worsened quite a lot. And um, looking more specifically, not just generally at mental health, that's a pretty broad term, but thinking more specifically about common mental health conditions like anxiety and depression. This was asking just, you know, again, generally, whatever your anxiety level was before COVID, what has it been like? This, you know, late April was again this survey. And people were indicating, you know, for the most part, many didn't have super high anxiety levels, but uh, before COVID, but uh, that those levels um, have quadrupled. So about 20% are saying, I now have really high anxiety levels. And similarly with depression, that a very small number were saying, I've got, you know, super high level of depression, um, but, uh, but more recently are saying, yes, that's gone up too. And that was taken down another, uh, sort of a one more level to, ask about well, what about those of you who've been diagnosed with an anxiety disorder, so have kind of a clinical level of anxiety or depression, 
And those levels um, have, uh, the anxiety levels or depression levels for those individuals has also doubled. Um, and a great question was asked, if social isolation has to continue for another couple months, what do you think is going to happen? And those individuals in particular um, we're, we're reporting that we think that the you know, depression is going to go up even higher. So this just tells us this has been hard. This has been hard on people. Um, I don't know about in other provinces, but I know in Manitoba there was a, a recent report in the paper that said that uh, alcohol sales have gone up, and so that's one retail business that was thriving and amongst all the others that weren't. Um, and of course the question is what's happening with all that alcohol that's been sold? So one of the questions uh, was that, in fact, there uh, there is a report that people are increase, uh, consuming more. They're having more alcohol, and if they are someone who uses marijuana, they actually, a significant number, are increasing the amount of marijuana they're using. Um, also, if you do have um, uh, anxiety or depression, there was a larger proportion of people who were reporting higher levels of alcohol or cannabis. Um, interestingly, none of those individuals felt that this was a problem or moving into a problem substance use. Uh, but I think that those are things that we need to be mindful of or be watching for. So what about, uh, so that was talking more generally about the adult uh, population across Canada. Um, there has uh, been a few surveys starting to look at, well, what about people specifically like those with IBD? So this is a European study that just uh, was published quite recently. And I don't think Canada was particularly well represented in it, um, but some of the European countries um, and, and other countries around the world had a fair number of uh, people who are participating. And I just highlighted a few of the things that came up from that. A uh, large, uh, you know, the vast majority of people quite concerned about getting COVID or contact with others, and particularly concerned about infecting others. So that, that sort of sense of responsibility for others. Um, and also a significant number concerned about what's the impact of the medications they take on their own risk. So this is really helpful to get a sense of what might be on the minds of and concerning for those with IBD. So that was European data. There's a study that's just started that's broadly across Canada and um, is looking also including in that subgroups of people who might have different health issues. So there's some very preliminary data with right now a fairly small number of people who've responded and was predominantly in terms of GI conditions, IBD or IBS, but we're really seeing some similar things. Uh, significantly elevated stress, um, sleep was flagged as something that uh, for a third of people has uh, really changed for them since COVID has started and also feeling more anxious about their health. But also helpful to see if you look on the, the other side here that a very large number of these individuals anyway were saying that they do feel they're getting some good support. Um, they have been doing things like exercising regularly and they've been looking for ways to manage that. Um, but already a quarter have been accessing resources for COVID-related mental health concerns. So this is just really helpful to give a bit of a window into um, how people are responding and how this might be impacting them. And why is this uh, why is this important? Well, I mean, it's important because uh, these will have these can have lasting impacts. But thinking even more specifically about inflammatory bowel disease and much of the work that Dr. Bernstein and I have done over many years has been looking uh, quite closely at um, the mental health needs and impact uh, for those who have IBD. And we do know that stress can impact IBD. It can increase uh, disease flares, um, among other challenges. And we also know that there's a greater vulnerability for anxiety or depression for those who have IBD. So there's a bit of a, a, a layer already of stress and mental health conditions um, having an effect on inflammatory bowel disease. And then we layer on top of that a really challenging time for um, many people um, related to this COVID pandemic. Uh, there's a lot to be figured out here. So stress is, is, uh, is going to be a common experience of most people um, across this pandemic, but also I think a, a take home message for today is that resilience, adaptive responding, 
being able to manage out of and through the acute challenges of the stresses right now, resilience is the norm, not the exception. And so as much as many people are feeling a lot of stress right now um, and may be struggling, um, there's, there's many ways people can kind of get their feet back under them, uh, connect with others, help others, help each other, connect in with other resources and be able to move forward. And this is just a few snapshots of things that probably many of you are familiar with. A group that's um, you know, having, making their choir virtually if they can't do it in person, ways to connect with family members and even ways to get outside and be able to still maintain distance and practice those safe behaviors. So just to talk a little bit more, look a little bit more at uh, what this impact might be um, and how it might show itself, the, the impact of uh, COVID and the um, you know, social distancing requirements, the economic changes and so on. I'm just gonna touch briefly on each of these four areas uh, that really make up how we, uh, how we think and, and feel and manage. So first of all, looking at how the what reactions we might have in terms of our thinking or the what's running through our heads. And worry is a big part of that. And this is what we hear from lots of people and what the surveys um, are telling us as well. There's lots to worry about. And if we dial back to three months ago, um, when we really didn't know how this was going to you know, unfold in uh, Canada um, and how we didn't know much about COVID, how readily it might um, impact us or, or uh, how at risk we might be. Uh, these were a lot of the things that were going on and not just you know worried about being infected or family and friends but just this sense many people experienced about just can't turn my brain off talked about a COVID mental fog so much you're trying to figure out all at once. Not just negative though so uh, other aspects that can that have come up are sort of a, a renewed sort of digging in commitment to what I need to do to be able to get through this. Lots of different emotions uh, coming up for people and different ones at different times, probably some all at the same time. Um, anxiety, fear, anger, I think are some common ones, frustration, sadness. I was talking with a colleague the other day who said when she was driving by the playground and didn't see children at the playground, she was just unexpectedly caught by this sense of sadness. Now that's going to start to change, but I think we haven't paid attention to a um, sense of grief that has come up through this, uh, not being able to connect with family members unless they live in the same household, they're in a different province, uh, if there's ill, if there's a, a, a death from the family not being able to be there. So lots of challenges coming up with feelings. But also again, um, not just negative feelings, but the impact has also connected in with what we took for granted, what we're still grateful for, new appreciation for things we may not have noticed before, and uh, a hopefulness in all of this. What about behavior changes? Uh, well, the data tells us that uh, in fact, uh, we have had some changes with uh, a little bit more um, uh, imbibing, um, using substances, um, alcohol in particular. Um, there's a bit of a conversation about the COVID belly, people eating more or trying to support their local restaurants. So there's a change in how we're eating. Um, taking in a lot of information in terms of the COVID, uh, you know, COVID updates and so on. But even, um, you know, making, uh, people have commented on that, you know, making errors, um, not being as, as focused, um, and um, the excessive cleaning is there, just uh, many people who ended up having to be at home uh, started looking in their closets and uh, I guess um, giving their place a bit of a once over because you're in those four walls for quite some time. And physiological, I think this is, was not necessarily on people's radar as much and is a good time to step back and have a sense of how you're doing physically. Um, but just having the constant sense of uncertainty, what's going on next, has really translated into things like um, even, you know, the heart beating faster, harder time sleeping, and a lot more tension. People not even realizing that they might be holding their breath a lot of the day, clenching their fists. So all of those are common reactions that are coming up in relation to all these challenges with COVID. And I guess the question is, 
um, what does that mean and, and what should I be doing about it? I'm going to be talking in a few moments about some ideas about what to do. Um, but just wanted to um, flag or, or, or kind of think for a moment about um, is there a point where I should be thinking about maybe taking some extra steps uh, to, to connect with help, or whether it's a little bit more with um, peers or family or kind of those natural supports or whether I should be maybe connecting with some mental health resources that might be in my community. And so here are some aspects that can help you to decide if you might need to take some additional steps for care. Um, just we'll go through them quickly, but certainly the distress level, um, if it's really difficult to sleep, if you have no appetite for eating, um, if it's hard to just stop you know, how you're feeling, the, the thoughts that are going on, and can't kind of take a break, connect with something a bit more day-to-day -day or usual. If it's getting in the way of your day-to-day, -day, again, it's hard to stay, uh, it, it's hard to organize yourself to be able to do something, uh, do what you normally would. Um, those who have mental health history, um, there is a vulnerability to this being a time that can really intensify that. Um, if you've been directly exposed to COVID or an outbreak you know, at your workplace or in your community, that can really escalate the anxiety and sometimes that might need a bit of extra care or attention. And certainly any significant death or loss or change at any time can really intensify um, how a person is managing and, and uh, where they may need some additional care or help. So what can you do? Uh, there's lots, there's lots that we can do. And I think we've talked about that in one of these past webinars. And I think that's an important aspect of all of this. There are a lot of things that are out of our control here, but there are also many things that you can do. And, it's, and even though uh, there's some really encouraging uh, uh, information that our uh, COVID, uh, the spread of cases is maybe starting to level out and go down. Um, I think the prediction in the medical community is that this is likely to ramp back up again or rear back up again in some months. So we need to be thinking not only about what we can be doing now, but paying attention to what we might be wanting to continue to look after. So going back to those four areas physiologically, what are some steps you can do? Um, certainly just paying attention to that muscle tension and um, looking at ways that you can interrupt that a little bit. Even things like just shifting breathing. This box breathing is a way to just in the moment, if you've got that racing heart, is just slow it down. Breathe in and hold, breathe out and pause. Just that kind of step. Exercise is can be a really helpful a stress reliever and important for being able to sleep and um, and con you know and continue on. And actually, that that uh, level of disturbed sleep that I noted earlier, um, keeping a, a sleep routine or getting back to a sleep routine or looking at steps that can help you sleep better uh, is going to be really important for your health generally. And actually, is important for your IBD health as well. Um, and as part of looking after whatever health condition you have, including for those of you here that have inflammatory bowel disease, um, part of looking after that is keeping connected with your care team or your, your doctor, particularly if anything changes. What about those feelings, those darn feelings that uh, um, where there's lots of uh, sometimes more intense emotions right now? So a couple of things to think about is often the way we think about things really drives how we're feeling. And so being able to notice what am I, what's going over and over in my head um, that's uh, leading me feeling um, you know, sad or angry. And so part of that's just being aware of. Also a really practical thing, and try it sometimes, it sounds a little bit strange, but it actually can be quite helpful, is rather than worrying all day through the day, is you kind of just say, hold on, you know, it's seven o'clock tonight, well, maybe not seven o'clock, but you know, let me set aside 20 minutes later today, and I'm just going to let those worries come through, come up, um, and, uh, but in the meantime, they're gonna go in the back burner. So it's a little bit more of, um, hurting, I guess, some of the ways that that worry just keeps doing and putting it in one spot. Um, also looking at what are the things that you're concerned about, feeling worried about, um, where you can where you can do something, um, and then 
there are many aspects that are out of our control and that becomes then focused more on again how am i feeling and being able to move um, beyond that and sometimes it's just things like you know distracting um, connecting with somebody so those are just touching quickly on some aspects to do with how you're feeling what about um, all of those things we may have been changing that weren't so helpful for us in terms of behavior? So this is not specific to COVID, except maybe the one in red there. But a lot of uh, steps that are helpful to do, uh, and I know you've heard it before, but this is the time to be looking at, can I eat you know, fairly regularly a varied diet with uh, food that's going to be uh, nourishing? Um, what about exercising regularly? Making sure you step back, really watching those uh, items that aren't so good for us and connecting with others. And then um, if particularly focusing on work and at home, this is the time to be able to let go a little bit because you just can't do it all. You might be trying to work from home, um, teach school to your children from home and so it needs to be you need to delegate some things at times or just um, let go of being able to do all of it in the way you might have before and I've highlighted the COVID information intake just because uh, particularly initially and maybe it's not happening as much now but initially people talked about having their televisions on all the time uh, you know on and also on all the social media what's next what can we learn next and it was information overload and so looking at doses of information and again setting a time I'm just going to check in once at the end of the day and whatever your favorite place is to get the information but going to reliable sources and that can really help with the anxiety that can get ramped up and what about those thoughts the way we think about things um, does really drive how we feel about it how much our heart is racing or not so this is a just a quick um, overview of some of what are called cognitive strategies to be able to shift whatever thoughts are stuck in there and so uh, this is an example of if what's what's stuck in your head is nothing will ever be the same again there's ways to step back from that and go hey that's just a thought I mean we don't know that yet and in fact things have changed and then challenging you know challenging that thought as well it's actually exercising up in your mind rather than just letting all of those um, um, thoughts and concerns just sit there with you. And tied to that thinking or that idea of reframing, in a couple of the surveys that uh, have uh, the Canadian surveys, uh, it wasn't just focused on how difficult has this been for you, what have the changes been, um, but there was some really helpful focus or interesting focus on is there anything um, that's come out of this that you might not have expected that might actually be okay and uh, the COVID Survey Canada which is actually one that has uh, just started and is actually ongoing uh, this is some preliminary information from an open-ended question that asked are there any silver linings and so if you go through that list you see that the connection the sort of intentional connection with family and friends virtually or in person if you can um, is something that has happened people are much more likely to reach out and call people they haven't chatted with for a while. Um, the uh, shift into virtual care, uh, all of us who work in hospitals and health centers thought that was still years away. We've been pushing for a long time to have uh, much, many more ways to be able to connect with um, our patients virtually, um, but all of a sudden that's what we're doing all day every day. And even changes in uh, traffic, uh, the, the planes are stopped, the, most of the cars are stopped, many of the buses are stopped. Well, um, you know, during that lockdown period, that has had some, some positive outcomes. And uh, if you look on the right there with the Mental Health Research Canada survey, which was done late April, there's a number of ways that activities that are maybe retro now, like reading, wow, um, or uh, the pets are maybe getting a, a positive outcome of COVID because they're people are home with them and spending more time with them. So one of the ways to think about flipping COVID, COVID has meant something scary and, um, and concerning and unknown. And uh, so there's a, a, a colleague by the name of uh, Russ Harris, um, who does some work in the US. And he has uh, suggested that we think about COVID having a different meaning. And so here's a way to uh, maybe 
when you think of COVID, not necessarily think just about the virus and its, uh, and its impact, but also what else it can stand for. So COVID can mean committing to action, focusing on what you can do right now. Also that idea of opening up, recognizing that these the feelings, the emotions that you're having um, are not unexpected, they're natural, they're normal, and uh, uh, letting yourself acknowledge that and then letting yourself connect with others, maybe even to reach out and say, hey, I'm, I'm struggling a bit. The idea of um, sometimes in a situation like this where we've had these significant changes and uh, difficult challenges is it really gets us focused back on what's important what do we really value and so looking at uh, out of what i want to do or what i want to make a point of um, ensuring i'm doing it, it does it tie to what's important and uh, and what i value and then the I in COVID was around identifying uh, resources that you might need, and that could be a, a family friend that could maybe give you some childcare relief. Um, it might be just the uh, a, a, a friendly face. Um, it might be some particular mental health resources, or even knowing what the crisis resources are in case um, that, that you or a family member is really, really struggling. And the last one, oh, I'm, I went too quickly, I didn't pause. But the last one was, if I can go back, uh, no, apparently not. Um, the last one that was around D was, was just um, being able to uh, develop a plan, to develop a wellness plan. I wonder, yeah, thank you. Um, Thank you. Uh, being able to look at, at uh, uh, particularly going forward, even as things are easing up right now, we may not be feeling the same stress or pressures, but anticipating that uh, we're likely going to have the uh, COVID uh, cases increasing again, what's going to help you going forward? And then this doesn't translate well, but we can uh, put it up on the um, uh, Crohn's and Colitis website uh, after this. But this is an example of how you might want to map out a wellness plan for yourself. And it's a little bit squished on the slide, but it's just looking at what are some things that are important for you to do day to day. And this was helpful, particularly in the social distancing period. But again, it may be something that's useful going, going on. Um, what are some things to make a point of doing occasionally? The things I should avoid doing because they're probably not going to be so helpful for my health. And importantly, what are my early warning signs that I'm starting to struggle or feel more distressed? What can I do in response to that? And um, if it does get into something really significant, um, what are some crisis resources or crisis responses? So that can be a bit of a map to doing that. And there are many resources. Um, locally, nationally, and, and uh, of course, uh, you can pick up many of them online. I just had uh, identified a few here that are um, focused on um, COVID and understanding the impact on mental health and some ideas about some steps to do as well. So just would put them out there for your interest, but know that that's not by any means an exhaustive list. So I hope this information has been helpful. Uh, there's many colleagues in my department who have been working um, with individuals, with, with colleagues, with frontline healthcare workers and others who have pulled together some of this information as well. I just want to acknowledge them. But thank you for the, um, the opportunity to be able to go through some of these ideas. I know we have some time for questions. I know Dr. Bernstein would like to get in there and then we'll have some good um, ideas and information as well. So I hope this was helpful for you. Thank you very much, Dr. Graf. That was great. Um, and I guess we can start off with Dr. Bernstein. It would be great to get your impression of what you're seeing in IBD patients. I mean, that number that came up in the poll kind of shocked me. I didn't expect, uh, you know, I expected a good number of people to be struggling with new mental health issues, but I didn't expect the number to be 75%. So what are your thoughts? Are you seeing that in your practice? Are you seeing that in your patients? Yeah, um, quite frankly, I've had the discussion with probably 90% of my patients. 90% of my patients have been phone discussions or maybe even more. And I've, I've still had very full clinics. And everybody wants to discuss um, whether they view it as their anxiety, whether they would actually report on a survey that they're actively anxious about it, 
everyone's anxious about it. They're anxious about um, <clears throat> that they're taking medications and does that matter? And they're anxious about that they have a disease even if they're on little to no treatment, does that matter? And they're very anxious about should they be in a workplace and especially if they're in the group that's on medications. And that's been a discussion I've probably had with 90% of the patients I've spoken to, even patients who are very well, they just want to talk about it. And I think mm -hmm. it's that we as uh, healthcare professionals can do for patients is to facilitate that conversation. And, you know, Leslie and I, and one of our dear uh, beloved uh, friends and mentors to both of us, John Walker, who was a big part of our group until he passed away last year, um, would, um, you know, often talk about um, the importance of just um, getting it out there and talking about what's just hanging in the air. It's, it's hanging in the air for all of us. We, if we don't have IBD, we're anxious about this. So um, I think what we've learned from a number of uh, web-based studies that we've done and survey studies that we've done is that as much as patients like and people like to use the web, they're still the strong, the almost number one res response on surveys is they want their healthcare professional, their physician, or if they use a nurse practitioner, they want to hear from them what they think, and they want that reassurance. So everyone out there, uh, if, uh, if you're a patient or a concerned friend or parent, um, have that conversation about exactly what your concerns are, because I can assure you that your physicians already have that conversation hundred times already. Mm -hmm. and I, I should say, can I just say one other thing, Eric? Um, one thing I would tell uh, patients and parents and people out there to get involved with is one of the things, the remarkable things we've seen in this COVID epidemic around the world, but including in Canada and especially in Canada, because I think we as Canadians are really good at this. People are getting involved in helping other people. So they're delivering meals and they're um, they're just doing a lot of incredible things um, to help their fellow human and they're going to shelters where they wouldn't have gone to shelters before but even just their older friends and neighbors they're they're getting them groceries they're getting them food another way to be useful and feel that you're turning this into a positive is to participate in research if you're an IBD patient and um, diff people like the Four people on the screen right now are, are calling with a with an email or a survey. Um, there's a lot of satisfaction knowing that you've helped to expand the knowledge, the knowledge that Leslie just translated to us. Um, it's got to come from somewhere. So participate. There, there's a wonderful national study that the four of us are involved with, and Crohn's and Colitis Canada has been a big supporter of, called Imagine. And uh, in that, imagine long before COVID, it's been uh, ongoing for a few years. It involves about 10 centers in the country and possibly up to 15. It's being led by Paul Moyetti and Ida Fernandez out of McMaster, um, but we're all involved. Um, and we were interested in having studies to understand mental health and its relationship to IBD and IBS and diet and the gut microbiome. So that's ongoing. Contact your local major IBD center, and I'm sure that you can uh, participate. And you'll feel like you're, especially now. I think there'll be other questions that we're all going to have. So I'll stop. No, it's something you said earlier. You said about you know talk to us, talk to somebody. Uh, one of the first questions we got from the audience, and we are taking a few questions from the audience at this point, if people want to put some questions in. But one of the first questions we got from the audience was from somebody struggling with anxiety. Uh, and asking who to talk to. Should they go to their family doctor? Should they go to their gastroenterologist? Who should they speak with about this? Well, I'll take that first, and then, of course, I'll pass it to Leslie because she's the one on my speed dial um, when I'm struggling with this. And, of course, Leslie and I have been working together for over 25 years, and we overwhelmed her with uh, a gastroenterology-related uh, practice. There's just not enough mental health resources around. I think that you should speak to whoever you can access or trust the most. It's true that some people feel they get kind of short shrift from their family doctor at times and may not feel the confidence to discuss certain issues with them. They may feel they get short shrift from their gastroenterologist who's counting the number of bowel movements they have and do they have bleeding and then they sort of never stop to say, how are you doing otherwise? On the other hand, if your gastroenterologist is somebody 
who you really have a deep relationship with because you really hashed out the complexity of which biologic to start and your gastroenterologist has seen you, you know, potentially at your worst if you've got IBD, you've been sick, you've been coming out of surgery, you may feel that you trust him or her the most to have the conversation. And especially if a lot of your anxiety is about IBD and your IBD medications, um, you know, many of us have been on these, you know, international and national calls and, and, and webinars discussing what the issues are. So we really have, a, I think, a common thing to, to discuss. The, the other question, and Leslie, I'll, I'll put it over to you about people really have anxiety or depression and they really do need help and they really want a, a healthcare professional. They, they, they really want to go beyond a web because they're those people that want to see a real human and talk to them and they, they, they want to get met, uh, information beyond reading on a website what could be good or bad. What would you have to do? Well, I mean, often, as, as you said, starting with your family doctor, your gastroenterologist, um, because they can sometimes be the link into some of the other mental health resources. Um, mo you know, most often hospitals will have outpatient departments with psychiatry or psychology. Um, there are, I do know that provincial governments and the federal government are um, paying attention to the fact that there are increasing mental health needs throughout this pandemic. People who weren't anxious before are getting anxious now. And so, I, you know, each province is a little bit different with how they've responded to that, but many of the provinces have looked at ways to um, increase those supports. Uh, people's employee assistant program, if they're working, they often have an employee assistant program through work that connects them to uh, counselors who may be able to help work through that or have extended health benefits that help them to link with, let's say, a psychologist in the community. Um, so those can be some aspects as well. Uh, Canadian Mental Health Association, an organization called Anxiety Canada, um, while they don't necessarily have counselors per se, they often have in their local chapters, um, they've often got kind of mental health resource um, guides that also help you to find your way to some individuals who may be able to help you. Um, some of the provinces are doing more with what are called online mental health therapies. And while that can help you to work through some of the tools that you might use, um, there's, there's something pretty important about talking with a person. Um, and even starting, as uh, Charles was saying, starting with a trusted family member or friend, because sometimes just being able to say out loud what you're struggling with and what you're concerned about and having that, that uh, you know, response back and sometimes even that problem solving back can go a long way. But sometimes it's more serious than that, more, more um, you know, clinically getting stuck than that. And so it may need as a medication tool, it may, may need some medication or it may need some of the um, sort of talking therapy tools that can be helpful. And just uh, there was a question from the, the audience that I um, actually wanted to step back and make it a bit of a general question, which was that the audience member was really concerned about, you know, the provinces opening up, going back to work, personal risk to them. And, and one individual was an older teacher. So, um, and I'm just trying to get a sense from both Dr. Bursi and Dr. Graf, how do you manage the anxiety of kind of, you just spent the last couple of months locked in, in your home where you've actually felt that there's a security bubble around you. Now now the world is opening up again, including you in terms of going back into work and other circumstances. How do you, how do you manage that? That's a great question. And I mean, initially the anxiety was around, you know, how are we going to keep safe? But then there is this sense of security bubble. I'm safe in my house. I'm doing all the right things. Um, and I mean, I think a key thing is to be able to get a, a good sense of what the risk is. And, you know, the slide that you had shown earlier, Gil, about the proportion of, um, of uh, people with COVID, you know, in each of the provinces, um, the, all of the steps that we can do around distancing. I mean, most of the workplaces that I'm aware of, um, one is still expected to social distance. A lot of the workplaces are saying, we're actually not gonna go back the way we were. If you are all in you know, cubicles, we've now got to spread out the distance. We've now got to put up um, barriers in between. 
I, I think with the, you know, the teachers with classrooms, we're also hearing that it's not going to look like it used to. There may not ever be a full classroom of children in a class at one time. So getting information to understand what the actual risk is right now. Um, when we're not somewhere, then there's actually some initial what's called anticipatory anxiety. Um, when we're going to have to do something we haven't been doing for a while, we will often feel the most anxiety just as we're moving towards doing that. So, you know, a teacher going back to the school empty of children may still find you feel quite anxious because you haven't been there for quite some time. But it's actually probably safer than it was just before uh, the lockdown with COVID because, uh, you know, it's been cleaned and there's nobody there. Um, but also, um, asking questions, um, making some suggestions, um, listening for and finding out what are the plans in place. There's no, no one that I'm aware of in any level of government has said this is business as usual. Um, it has been the opposite. It has been let's start going back because we need to recover economically and socially, um, but we still have precautions we need to put in place. And so the new reality is meetings like this, six feet apart, um, you know, your hand sanitizer right on hand, um, and all those other aspects. I wanted to raise a. Oh, go ahead, yeah, I was just going to say uh, uh, three points. Hopefully, I can make them um, brief. Um, the first thing, when, when the, the epidemic started and in Winnipeg, and we didn't know which direction it was going to go, it, it might have gone as, as, you know, badly as it's gone in Quebec, but in, in fact, it's gone extremely well here and the, the curve is really flat. But I didn't know that in the beginning, and I actually felt less anxious going to work. I actually felt the safety of being in the hospital. The hospital was a place that was taking precautions, and I felt like I was doing something, and I wasn't at home watching TV. Uh, or being distracted to watch TV when I was trying to do work. So for everybody who's thinking about, should I go back to work now? The answer is yes. And if your workplace is saying we're open again and you need your employment, and clearly once you get there, if you see that they're taking the precautions seriously, then work is a good thing. It's good for your soul and it's good for your both mental and physical health and it's good for your household economy. So I get that question a lot from patients, and the answer is yes, is you're well, and you should go back to work. The second thing is if you're not well, um, you should go to the hospital, you should go to your doctor's clinic, because there's been a lot of fear of showing up at, at uh, doc, you know, the doctor's clinics and the hospital. And Leslie alluded to the, the second bump related to COVID of people who were having their heart attacks at home and not coming in for two weeks, and now we're having to deal with the consequences of that. So if you have, if you're sick with your IBD, if you're having increased symptoms, and maybe your symptoms aren't specifically driven by your IBD, but they're from something else, don't hesitate to go to your doctor. And if it's beyond a phone call, because you want to see that doctor and have that conversation with her or him, um, do it. The last thing I would say, uh, and this is just a philosophical thing, and it's not my absolute medical advice, but there's a lot of people we've not socially connected with for the last two or three months, and some of them are our very loved our children or our aunts or our parents. And speaking personally, I have a 94-year-old mother who's wonderful and quite um, hilarious, quite frankly, and she's a lot of fun, but she's 94 and living on her own. She has lots of children and grandchildren in Winnipeg, and none of us saw her for two months. And how, how many blocks of months are we going to have with our 94-year-old mother? And by chance, um, she sprung a leak in her, in, her, uh, in her kitchen sink, and so she had to get out of her condo. She came to stay with us for um, uh, a weekend, and it was really good for all of our soul. Um, it was it was uh, it was um, really good for us to be with her. And uh, somehow, I've gotten off the webinar. I don't know if you can still hear me. Oh, no, we yeah, can yeah, hear you. We can yeah, hear you we and can. see you. We can hear you and okay. see you. Yeah. No, I was. I think I was just getting a uh, message about the next webinar. But the last thing was just to say to sum up. But I think it's a time in the places that are opening up, you should start reconnecting with the people you need to connect with and sort of merging bubbles. I, I highly encourage that. I think it'll be good for your mental health. Spoke of yeah. Dr. Graf, do you think it'll be good for our mental health? Absolutely. Absolutely. We just took a trip to see my uh, parents who are in their 80s and 
And uh, it, we, we did actually keep some distance from them, but it had been three months since we'd actually been able to see them in person. So, and, and it, it was actually um, quite a pleasure to be able to do that in a way that was almost uh, unexpected. And it's part of that really appreciating what I think you took for granted before. Mm -hmm. Good for the soul. I want to bring up one last point before we end, and I know we're running a few minutes over time, if that's okay. Um, Dr. Graff, you mentioned a little bit earlier the link between mental health and IBD, even in good times, and that, you know, I think it's worth discussing the link between inflammation and mental health and the importance of that message that we keep sending to patients that despite all of this, the most important thing you can do is keep healthy, keep in remission for your IBD and keep on your medications. Can you talk about this issue of remission and flare-ups and how that links with mental health? Yeah, well, we certainly have some sense that uh, um, with depression that there may be an inflammatory, you know, maybe a common pathway of, you know, inflammation with, uh, with depression and uh, uh, other areas of the body, including inflammatory disease, uh, inflammatory bowel disease. We also know that stress seems to play a big role in inflammatory conditions, including IBD. And and if we think about um, the you know the COVID-19 outbreak, um, there's lots of reasons to do all of the good things we need to to stay healthy. One of which is if we get exposed to a virus. Um, if we come well rested and well fed and well exercised and, you know, fairly calm, uh, we think all of those are the ingredients that help us to be able to fight off, you know, a cold or a flu just in regular times. And then certainly for inflammatory bowel disease, um, we know from, uh, you know, when the disease, when your disease is fairly quiet, it's in a good place, it's in remission, um, our, our mental health is better. And it's, all, it's sort of a two-way street there that we may be feeling better because the disease is better, but in part the disease can be better because we're managing better with our mental health. Uh, so these go hand in hand um, quite, quite closely. So the things that you can do that keep your disease um, settling or moving into remission and the things you can do to keep your mental health um, sort of healthy, you know, and, uh, and positive are, are both going to, to work to help the other. I know, I know we're running a little bit over time, but I just wonder if I could ask you a question about closure. Um, I know, and I, and I speak from a personal experience, but I know a lot of people have lost loved ones, not necessarily due to COVID, but it's the impact of not being able to attend a funeral, not being able to say goodbye and all these types of things, just being like, and the stories that you see in the, in the news, and, and you just feel like you're kind of caught in this like stasis bubble, and then and at some point you're hoping it releases and you can get kind of closure at the end of it and say proper goodbyes and like that. And I'm curious to, just, I'm, I'm sure I'm not alone in, in that feeling. I'm just, what, what you'd say to people in, in that context, like how kind of managing between now and, and eventually when we get to that point. Yeah, well, and I think you've, you've touched on it, Gil, that there's, there's kind of what we can do right now and what we maybe hope we'll be able to do when things open up more. I think it's just been crushing for people who've lost a loved one. Um, I have a colleague going out to BC right now whose father's passed away and and but you know if that had happened a couple of months ago they wouldn't be able to go and and even even now I think it will still be difficult for people who've lost loved ones for any reason so certainly we have the ways that we can to be able to reach out it's not going to be satisfying you know what do you need you often we need to hug and show up and bring food and all of those things that say we care and that also help us to uh, be able to feel and acknowledge and and uh, live and share that grief. So I think part of it is, is just recognizing this may, that the sadness and, and grief and loss may sit with you in a way that you don't quite expect um, and that it may stay there for some time, but actively and intentionally um, reaching out in the in whatever ways that you can. And I think for many, they're kind of holding in reserve that we'll pick this up and we'll connect um, whatever months it is from now. Maybe we'll go, uh, maybe we'll, you know, uh, visits. I think some are holding off memorial services until a time when people can come. And so there's, there's different ways that people are approaching it. But this is, I think that aspect has been uh, in some ways, a, a really tragic part of all of this, that what we do to say goodbye when we've lost someone is we connect and we collect 
And uh, this is it's really getting in the way of being able to do that in the usual meaningful way that we do. So with that, I think we're going to thank you very much for joining us this week on the webinar. Uh, it was really helpful. I think I think the audience uh, obviously appreciated all the help that you've given. We're going to send out some documents tomorrow, I guess. Sarah is saying with some links that you provided in your presentation, so patients will have access to the uh, to the information. Certainly not the last webinar we're going to do about mental health in IBD. Uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. So if you do have questions, please send them in with your evaluation of the webinar and at future webinars, we'll do our best to answer them. Um, so with that, I just wanted to plug the next week's webinar, which will be an interesting and different one. Uh, so next week we have uh, Dr. Lisa Barrett, who's coming back. She's an infectious disease expert from uh, Halifax, from Dalhousie, and she is on our Crohn's and Colitis Canada COVID-19 task force. Uh, to talk about washroom access during COVID-19. And she's going to be joined by Leslie Lowe, who uh, wrote a book about the public use of washrooms. Um, and they're really going to talk about what we've been hearing from patients as to concerns about whether it's safe to use public washrooms and whether restaurants should be opening their public washrooms. Is it safe for them to do that and making it accessible to you? So please join us next week. Uh, as per always, I do want to thank all of our uh, frontline health workers, frontline workers and employees and, and everybody, all the essential workers who are manning grocery stores. I think this week in particular, I want to thank researchers, both because I attended that Canadian Association of Health Services and Policy Research, which is really stepping up at looking at how the healthcare system can deal with all the aftermath of COVID-19, but also researchers because we had some good news today that the Canadian Institutes of Health Research was actually reinstating the spring competition. We had mentioned to you a few weeks back that they had canceled the spring competition and therefore only half the research grants would be funded this year by the government. Uh, and in fact, they've reinstated it because uh, you know, organizations like Crohn's and Colitis Canada who, who uh, voiced their concern very strongly have said that we really need these research dollars both to improve the lives and find a cure for Crohn's and colitis and also to find a cure and to improve uh, you know, outcomes in COVID-19. So uh, thank you to CIHR and thank you to all the researchers who are working on these scientific problems that we need desperately to find answers to. And then finally, as usual, I want to ask you for donations to Crohn's and Colitis Canada, please. Uh, all of these webinars are organized by uh, volunteers as well as a very small staff of Crohn's and Colitis Canada uh, people who are very dedicated to bringing this information to you. But as I mentioned in previous webinars, the in-person events have all been cancelled and that has put a huge dent into our ability to raise funds. And so please, please, if you appreciate these webinars, please donate to Crohn's and Colitis Canada. In particular, if you want to show your support for these webinars, if you go to gutsywalk.ca and look for Gil and Eric's COVID IBD webinar team, I think it's the, oh, there we go. There's the, the yeah, I got it right. Um, and the, the website is shown there. We're number two. We're still number two in terms of the donations. We want to be number one, but honestly, anywhere you want to donate is completely fine as long as you donate to Crohn's and Colitis Canada. But if you want to show your support for the webinars, please log on to gutsywalk.ca and uh, to that tiny CC slash COVID webinars website and please donate to our team. And thank you very much. We will be back next week as per usual and hoping that you can join us. Have a great week. Thanks a lot.